So good morning. We are back uh, to the study of the gospel according to Spiritism. Uh, today is the fifth Sunday of the month. Uh, normally we, we have a special uh, lecture when we have five Mondays, but we don't have anything uh, scheduled for this Sunday. So we're going to do, go back to the gospel, which is always, always good, always important. Okay. Um, Soraida, can you read for us? Yes. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Many are called, but few are chosen. Parable of the wedding feast. Speaking further through parables, Jesus said to them, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanting to give his son a wedding feast, sent his servants to call on those whom he had invited. However, they refused to come. The king then sent other servants with orders to tell the invitees. I have prepared the feast. I have slaughtered my cattle and what I have ordered to be fattened. Everything is ready, come to the wedding feast. However, they were not concerned and one went to his house in the country and another to his business. The others seized his servants and killed them after having badly mistreated them. When the king, when the king found out he was filled with anger and having sent his armies he exterminated those murderers and burned their city. He then said to his servants, the wedding feast has been fully prepared, but those who have been invited were not worthy of it. So go to the crossroads and call to the wedding feast all whom you meet. His servants then went into the streets and gathered all those whom they met, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with people who sat at the table. The king then entered to see those who were at the table and noticing a man who was now wearing a wedding garment, he said to him, my friend, why have you come in without a wedding garment? The man remained silent. Then the king told his servants, bind his hands and feet and cast them into outer darkness. There they shall be weeping and gasping of teeth and for many are called, but few are chosen. Okay. Um, Elmo, he wants us to stop here or you want to read, continue? Hi, Elmo. Continue? Uh, it's on mute. I don't know. Um, no, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> we had already covered this item. We can uh, do a quick comment to this and go to where we stopped last week, which is. Uh, not all, who, not all who say, Lord, Lord, we enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Uh, we did the narrow door already? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. So let's start here then, Soren. Okay. Not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And all who say the Lord, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who have done the will of my father who's in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And did we not perform many miracles in your name? And I will tell them clearly, away from me, you who have done deeds of iniquity. Therefore, everyone who hears my words and practices them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. When the rain fell, the rivers flooded and the winds blew and battered the house. It did not fall because it had been built upon the rock. But anyone who hears my words and does not practice them is like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. When the rain fell, the rivers flooded and the winds blew and battered it. It caved in and great was its ruin. Continue? Yeah. Yes, please. He who breaks one of the one of least of these commandments and teaches men to break them will be regarded as last in the kingdom of heaven. But he who abides by it and teaches them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Number nine. All those who proclaim Jesus' mission say, Lord, Lord, but what use is it to call him master of, or law, Lord, if they do not follow his precepts? Are Christians those who honor him with, with 
outward acts of devotion, but who at the same time yield to pride, selfishness, greed, and all their passions? Are his disciples those who spend their days in prayer, but who as a result are no better, more charitable or more indulgent toward their fellow beings? No, because just like the Pharisees, their prayer is on their lips, but not in their heart. They might impress others with their form, but not God. In vain, they will say to Jesus, Lord, we prophesied. That is, we taught in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We ate and drank with you. He will answer them. I do not know who you are away from me. You who committed iniquities, you who belied your words with the actions, you who slandered your neighbor, robbed widows and committed adultery away from me. You whose heart distilled hatred and bile, you who spilled the blood of your brothers and sisters in my name, you who caused tears to run instead of drying them. For you, there shall be weeping and gasping of teeth. For the kingdom of God is for those who are kind, humble, and charitable. Do not expect to bend the Lord's justice because of the multiplicity of your words and genuflections. The only way open to you for finding grace before God is that of sincerity, sincerely practicing the law of love and charity. Jesus' words are eternal because they are the truth. They are not only a surety of life in heaven, but a pledge of peace, tranquility, and stability in matters regarding life on earth. That is why all human political, social, and religious institutions that are based on his words will be as stable as the house built upon the rock. People will keep them because they will find happiness in them. However, those who are in violation of his words would be like the house built upon the sand. The winds of transformation and the river of progress will bring them down. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My apologies for the little delay. So let's remind that this chapter is many are called, but few are chosen. You know, I think the significance of the title of the, tra the chapter in association with the reading is, is important to us. And not all who say, Lord, Lord, you, we went to the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and, the, and when they, Christ says that we will look at him at, in, at one point and say, did you not prophesy in your name? Did you not cast out demons in your name? And did we not perform many miracles in your name? And we can say that we spiritists, you know, did you not give passes in your name? Did you not attend to the studies in your name? Did you not participate in the fraternal fraternal assistance in your name? Did you not read your gospel over and over and over and over and over, and over in your name? And he may have the same answer to us. There is a passage, there is one of, one of the readings in... Um, Boa Nova, if you translate literally, it'll be the good news, or we could say it's the gospel, right? It's a book, a psychography of, uh, from Chip Xavier of um, Brother X, uh, in which one of the disciples, in the very beginning of the, of the formation of the, the of the 12 disciples, even before they start going walking around and they start doing most of the work already with Jesus, put them in training, so to say, yet for the work. <clears throat> and we are still in training for the work. And Andrew was kind of depressed, melancholic, because he was asked by Jesus to go expel the demons, so to say, of one of the old lady, and he could not do it. So because he could not do it, he referred her back to Jesus, and Jesus was able to do it, naturally. 
And that made me very sad, very, very down with himself. And he questioned Jesus, and Jesus is not answering at that time. Just continue doing work, you know, at this point. And in a further opportunity, uh, he asked Andrew, Andrew, what's the purpose? What's the objective of being here with us? Right? And he kind of went around a little bit, trying to find the answer that Jesus wanted, right? And finally, he was inspired to say what really was the purpose is to elevate myself, to better myself, to learn from, from you so I can conquer um, the heavens or the, 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 the eternal life, whatever the expression is used. And, and Jesus went along with that answer and explained to him that our job here our opportunity here now is exactly that, is to use the tools that we have at our hands to better ourselves, to better ourselves better. Try to tell him that in order to be able to help that woman to do what was asked for him, he would first have to free the demons of him. Him, free himself first. He would be able to purify himself first. And go along, it goes ahead and, and says that what he came to teach us is to love. And the exercise of, you know, of course, is a metaphor, removing the demons of purifying others. can only be done when we have love within ourselves. When we are purified ourselves, when we are in a position of authority over the demons. And finally, uh, Andrew understood the message. And I think there's a lot to do with this passage. And of course, when Jesus um, elected Paul to spread his teachings, Paul, as smart he was, was not in the position to teach new things. So in reality, what, what Paul did was teach the teachings of Jesus, not the teachings of Paul, right? He had to learn, he spent all the time in the desert. He, he spent all the time with a tremendous amount of hardship to reach the level of humili humiliation, purification that allowed him to be a ambassador of, of Jesus. So what Paul did really was pass along the teachings of, of Jesus. And in one of, his letter of the Corinthians, the first letter of the Corinthians, he says what we know by heart already, right? Um, the first letter of the Corinthians, when he says, if I speak the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a ring gong or a clanging symbol. If I have a gift of prophecy and I, and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have absolutely if I have absolute faith so as to move mountains, if I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and exalt in, in surrender of my body, but I have not love, I gain nothing. This is exactly what this passage of Christ says. Not all who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who have done the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. It is an invitation, or is a suggestion, the same he gave to Andrew in that, in that passage. We need to humble ourselves to be 
like an sponge to absorb all the teachings that is available to us. But absorbing all the teachings intellectually, it's good enough, it's good, but it's not good enough. It's better than nothing. But if we're not able to transfer that knowledge, the intelligence, intellectual intelligence with the intelligence of the heart, with the sentiments, because the sentiments is the great generator, the, gen the sentiments what generates thoughts, and thought is what generates actions, thought is what generates words, right? Then you have not conquered anything. And that's why Paula says, even if you have done all the wonderful things, you know, give away all your goods, give away even your body, but if you have not loved it, still you have done nothing. Because that's the will of our Father. And it starts with us ourselves being humble enough one, to understand our limitations. Two, to not be limited by our limitations, but to expand our potentials. And three, the very little that we do, that we are able to do, we do with love. We do with the absolute sense being completely selfless. At the moment that I will give passes, at the moment that I will sit here and give this, uh, have this conversation, at the moment that I give a dollar to someone uh, seeking uh, a reward, I already not loving, I already being selfish. At the moment that I be doing this, for the sake of doing this, because this is important to me, this is important to others, the very little that I have to offer is very, very, very little but I, I offer without an expectation, without any sense of reward, then I am exercising love. And that's what um, Jesus from all the reading I think, does expect from us. Our best effort, even with all our limitations, to be able to express the most pure sentiment and the most pure sentiment cannot be exercised when it's corrupted by pride, by desire for reward. So to be in the synagogues or to be in the spiritual centers or to be in the mosques or to be in the church of all kinds of um, orientation, being able to verse everything, being able to call Lord, Lord, from back and right, memorize the whole gospel and first and the second um, revelations. But if you do not love, we have done nothing. And I think that is the message of this passage. Comments, questions? Yeah, I think if you think of uh, of the time that this was uh, written, right, it's uh, it's revolutionary because uh, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, we come from a long tradition of, uh, you know, going to the church every Sunday or going to the synagogue every Saturday and, uh, and do external acts of adoration, right? And uh, and then the spirit comes and tells us it's what counts is what the inside. All external acts of adoration are meaningless because what uh, what matters is your uh, connection with the divinity from your heart. It uh, it you know almost two hundred years later we're still not not ready for that struggling to to understand that um, but uh, I think more and more you see out there uh, people understanding this this need this necessity of less outward acts and more inward acts right yeah and I see the the difficulty to difficulty to make that transformation to reach that level 
the disciples living with Jesus, eating with Jesus, spending you know, almost 24 seven with Jesus, had tremendous difficulty of understanding his message. I mean, the same thing with Andrew here, later one was Peter, when Peter says, why can't we do this? What you, what you do? And Peter, and, and, and Jesus again answered, you know, people of little faith, how long do I have to spend with you, right? If you have the, the faith of grain of, of mustard, you can move mountains. And we see here also the, the preparation, the, the elevated moral qualities of uh, Paul of Tarsus, when he was able to really understand educate their mind and educate their heart to be an ambassador of, of Jesus and repeat his words naturally in different ways. And this passage is quite poetic, but it absolutely, well, at least I believe, with close to absolute fidelity. And we are still struggling. But I think that when you read those things, you have to be careful also not to put ourselves down. We have a tendency to be kind of harsh on ourselves. And when I read things like that, and because I'm average, I, I imagine the average you read will <laughs> go along with this and say, oh my God, I didn't see the struggle here. You know, what what Jesus is asking from us and what Eras confirms in the spirits in the medium's book is this, we know, we know the, what you have to overcome. We know your difficulties. And if Jesus asks us to be charitable, if Jesus asks us to be indulgent and forgiving, you have to understand that Jesus is also indulgent and forgiving. There are no breaks. We're gonna have to do it. And as I said a few weeks, there is no C plus, B minus, you know, in, in our progress is only 100%. And we're gonna have to struggle and repeat and repeat until you reach uh, 100%. But if to the, today we're able <clears throat> to do 55, tomorrow do 56, and then get to a point that things got a lot easier because then you get that strong momentum and the ball is rolling quite faster and get to a point that things start become a lot easier. I think we are now at, the ball is, is moving but a very slow pace yet and didn't get that momentum, didn't get that speed downhill yet. But I like to believe that all of us are here reading this, trying to figure this out, had that movement already going that direction. If it doesn't, if it does not reach that great momentum, it's a matter of time and effort. Any comments, any questions? All right, so we can move on to item 10. Much will be asked of him who has received much. 10. The servant who knew his master's will, but who nevertheless neither prepared himself nor did what was expected of him will be harshly punished. But he who did not know his master's will, but who did things worthy of punishment, will be punished less. Much will be asked of him who received much, and a greater accounting will be required from those to whom many things were entrusted. Number 11. I have come into this world to exercise judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Upon hearing these words, certain Pharisees were with him and said to him, then are we blind also? Jesus answered them, if you were blind, you would not have sinned, but you now say that you see, and that is why sin remains in you. 
number 12. These maxims find their application, especially in the Spirit's teachings. All those who know the precepts of Christ are surely blameworthy if they do not practice them. But besides the fact that the gospel that contains, contains them has spread only in the Christian denominations, how many persons there are in them who do not read it? And those who do not read it, how many there are who do not understand it? The result is that Jesus' own words have been lost to the majority. The Spirit's teachings, which reproduce these maxims under different forms and which develop and comment on them in order to put them within everyone's reach, have the particularity of not being at all circumscribed and everyone literal, literate or illiterate, believing or disbelieving, Christian or not, can receive them because spirits communicate everywhere. None who receive them either directly or through intermediary can claim ignorance of them. They cannot offer as an excuse either their lack of instruction or the obscurity of the teachings, allegorical meaning. Thus, those who do not take advantage of the teachings for their advancement, who admire them as being interesting and curious without their hearts being touched by them, who are no less vain, no less proud, no less selfish, no less attached to material possessions, or who are not better toward their neighbor, are all the more guilty because they have a greater means of knowing about the truth. Thanks. Mediums who receive- oh, That's good, thank you. Okay. So I think it was a very true, very strong statement um, from Jesus. And um, also, as I have said before, the ones that when you read, we, if you're not that careful, we may misunderstood and take it the wrong way and kind of hurt ourselves more than use it as a good tool for our growth. We cannot really be harsh to someone who doesn't know something and commit, and commit an error regard to those things that they don't know. We had spoke uh, prior before and absolute right and wrong. Yes, there is an absolute right and wrong. But there is also a relative right and wrong. Okay, and the example that I use in the Spirit Center, I can repeat here when we forgot the last studies is, if something, it's deer hunting season. Let's say that I like to hunt, which I don't. And I get my license. I get all the proper documentation. I get all the proper gear. I go at the proper place of hunting. I go at the proper time that is allowed to hunt. And I select to hunt those that are permissible by law to everything right. And I'm there in the right place at the right time with all the documentation and I shoot at a deer and I miss the deer and I shoot someone behind the deer. Another hunter that was there by it's wrong. It's one thing I missed the target. It's, it's an absolutely wrong. And if you say, oh, this was an accident, yeah, it's an accident. It's still wrong. Oh, you should be forgiven. Well, the forgiving comes from myself to myself to begin with. If you don't think that it's all that wrong, go ask the guy who got shot. Go ask his family, go ask his boss. They're not gonna have the employer to work for him for the next few days or worse, never again. So there is an absolute wrong there. Then you take to the relative and then all those you buts and ifs and those are taken comes into consideration, right? 
oh, but it was an accident. You didn't mean it. You missed the target. That I saw that the, the 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 deer jumped right at the time of your shot, and you all those buts uh, relatives, and you come into consideration. Were they wrong? What's that? We all go to jail. Well, yeah, it, it just depends on my lawyer. Will the judge be harsh on me? Probably also depend on my lawyer, how, how, how my lawyer can manipulate the relatives or the bats, the bats, but it is but that, but that, right? Likely not gonna be severely punished since I, as I declared here, everything was in order except that I missed my shot. Now, the, let's assume that everything happens the same to situation, but I'm not legal to hunt. But there was not the right season to hunt. The absolute remains the absolute. And all the bots getting less and less and less. So I'm gonna become more and more and more responsible for that incident. And the very, exa the very example was just that I missed the shot. Now I compile that I missed the shot because I didn't have a license, because it's not hunting season, because that was not the right spot there was a, not a legal area for hunting and I just complicated the thing and the severity of my responsibility increases. Our law does that. We very imperfect, very biased individuals create laws that take some of those buts into consideration. Can we imagine this perfect system of law that is meant to, uh, to exercise absolute justice, taking all the buts and nips and into consideration, will take also. And the most important of those, Jesus says, in the book says, one is the intention, and two is the knowledge. So you go back to the first example, I have everything right, I missed the shot, I did I really miss the shot? Did I use the opportunity of miss, pretend that I missed the shot because I really wanna hit that person? That it's, perhaps nobody will know that but myself. <clears throat> um, my responsibility in accordance with divine laws and in accordance to what we learn here, we we start from there, the intention. But also there is the second one comes the knowledge. So if the servant knows the will of the father and chooses to neglect it and chooses not to fulfill his or her duties, choose to disobey it, will be severe, severely punished, the one who did not know will also be punished. This says over here, because it is an absolute, okay? But he who did not know his master's will, but who did th things worth of punishment will be punished less. So the things are still worth of punishment but because he lacks the knowledge, he will be punished less. And again, let's not misinterpret the word punishment. Not, no, I think we don't have to be repeating this every time that God does not punish. God offers no opportunity of learning missed lessons. God educates through love and re-educates through pain. So there is no punishment. Build a house the first time the right way, following the directions, you have a good house, a good house right there. You choose to build a house 
on your own way without following the guidance of an architect or this and that, and then it, the house falls apart, the work will be triple now. Because you're going to have to clean up the area, prepare everything, buy all, buy all the necessary materials again, and rebuild a house. You do it right. The first way, follow the directions, follow the guidance. You're done. You're good. You choose to do it one way. You choose to ignore the laws. You choose to ignore the rules. You, you choose to ignore the recommendation by those who know better. You triplicate the amount of effort, the work and investment. Choices that we make, right? <clears throat> and I think that is the, the message over here. If a blind man is walking down the street with his cane, bang, 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 and the blind man um, hits you, you no, know, touches you, would you really be upset, mad, curse um, that blind man? No. Likely, it's my fault. You should be paying more attention. The other one is incapable of, he has no eyesight. If a blind man hits me when I'm walking, it's, it's my fault. I should be paying attention. I should, I should have noticed that that man could not uh, see me and I should get out of the way. Just an accident. Yeah, it's just an accident. But Let's say somebody got injured and um, they call the police, the police is gonna say, well, it's your fault. You should have recognized. He has no blame because he can't see. And naturally the, the application is for us, right? At one point, we received the first revelation. You know, it started with Abraham with monotheism and followed by Moses with some of the revelation of the divine laws. <clears throat> At least 10 of them can guarantee of the divine nature. And I have to put up his own and of 613 of them. And out of those 613, somewhat of divine origin and great majority it's not. Then the become Christ, reinforce the first and presents a second revelation. So now we are responsible for the knowledge of everything contained on the first of the divine nature, of course, and you're responsible for the second revelation for we being exposed to it, we have the knowledge. You cannot um, call ignorance any longer. We go back to the to Jesus' statement when I was in the Christ about just supposed to last words. You know, forgive them for they don't do not know what they're doing. Can we claim that sound? Don't we know? Perhaps they had, if Jesus said, you no, know, he had a, I don't think Jesus would lie. So and Jesus told them, forgive them for the, they do not know what they are doing. That was then. Can we do that again? Would Jesus in his prayer ask his father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing? After I already stand for the first revelations when i went back myself for the second revelation and when i and now the third part they're going to read to read here now is spiritists um i sent the spirit of truth for the third revelation so perhaps a lot more should be asked when those have been exposed to all this, 
Oh, so spiritualist, I some still struggle. But that does us see it. Not really. The spirit's teachings is everywhere for everyone. So even those who are not being exposed to the doctrine itself directly, the spirits are everywhere. At all the time, teaching. Could not be, you not be reasonable to imagine that Jesus or the divine laws would circumscribe this distorted third revelation to us such a limited geographic location with limitations of spreading. No, 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 now we have internet and it's all over the place for who, whoever wants. But even besides that, it's saying here, the spirit's teachings, it's everywhere and it's for everyone. So no one can really um, claim um, ignorance any, any longer. And if you persist <clears throat> in putting our passions and vices above our responsibilities and apply what have you learned, then yeah, perhaps uh, much will be asked from, from us because you received a, a lot. Comments, questions? No, yeah, it's like a good channel reading. Hello. Yes, please. Elmo, the, uh, you know, I, I never, uh, we all know that uh, those, if you know better, your, your, your mother tells you this, uh, Johnny, I've told you know better than to touch the oven when it's on. Uh, after she had told you uh, time uh, before uh, that it's hot, don't touch. I've, I've never um, put together Christ on the cross saying, forgive them um, for they, uh, they know not what they do with that. Uh, so that's interesting. You know, I always thought it's just a separate saying. I never connected it um, as being that. And I always wanted to ask you about the uh, with the hunters. The first example had um, uh, we could have went further and added that he was uh, well trained, um, the hunter. But you said it was uh, in both cases uh, there was an uh, absolute wrong. Is the absolute wrong the result? Uh, is the uh, is the man being shot uh, the result? Is that the absolute wrong? Uh, and it just has those um, other aspects of being a uh, accident in in varying degrees. Yes, yes. The absolute wrong is that the bullet that was meant for a deer hit a human being. being. Does the absolute wrong in there? Yes. And that, that's an absolute that you cannot, you cannot put any buts or any ifs or anything else there. It, it's a bullet in a human being, period. Yeah, it's not, like the, the, it's not like the wrong was hunting or the wrong was uh, the not not setting your sights on the gun or whatever kind of thing. It just was the the end result was the was the wrong. Correct. Correct. And that is an absolute. And then everything else is the are the relatives, right? Well, it, it was wrong, but it was the right place with the right documentation, well trained as a good addition. Thank you. Okay. Um, he checked his uh, whatever the, the gun, whatever they used to hunt with, they checked everything, everything. And the only thing that I can say that is wrong here is that is that absolute thing that the bullet was meant for the deer and end up in somebody's body, human being, not human being. And now, the law, our the law, human law being could be in the wrong place, right? Huh? Even the human being could, could have been in the wrong place, shouldn't have been there, right? Yeah, I would be very careful with that. It's, it's, it's almost real. 
you make the victim guilty of something. <laughs> yeah, it's a very dangerous <laughs> thing. Well, there are things he's uh, supposed to wear orange in the hunting area. Those are, yeah, like yeah. Contributing factors would be a legal thing. Yeah, yeah. But my point is that even um, our law will take all those possibles, all those buts, ifs, this and that into consideration in order to exercise the law as we understand the law today and make it applicable. Can we imagine the divine laws that will take everything into consideration? And again, the most important is intention. I could have done everything and just use as a good excuse because I want to kill that person and pre or pretend that I missed. And then I'm absolutely guilty uh, with my with the divine laws, I'm just a little guilty with my unconscious because the intention was there, and my may may easily escape our legal justice here, right? Because the intention is something that on, only I really know, and of course, not taking in, in, into consideration the smartness of the lawyers will be able to extract something from me or may not, right? That's what that's what the the work of the lawyers there. But in, in taking things into consideration, the most important one, again, intention, and two, is what Jesus presented to us, the knowledge. We didn't have the, the intention, but you know better, or you should know better. You know, you put your hand on the stove and you burn your hand, you cannot claim ignorance because your mom told, told you a thousand times already not to do it. Do you have to experience for yourself? Now you have to deal with the consequences, right? So I, I think in, in um, when putting things in the scales of our responsibilities, how much responsible I am, one intention to knowledge. And again, Jesus himself had sent the first revelation. Started with Abraham, continue with, with um, Moses, came himself, but brought to the second revelation, asked Paul to reinforce it, sent the, the promised consoler. Can you really claim ignorance? Would he be able to look at how far the eyes and say, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. I think I would give a good laugh at Jesus' face if he said something like that. We cannot claim ignorance anymore. We are not the servants who do not know anymore. Uh, Elmo, um, just a, a question in the previous reading. Um, it took my mind a little while to catch up. Uh, there was a, there gave me the feeling that if the, if the teaching was available to me and was presented to me and I wasn't paying attention, um, that I would have been considered, um, I don't know the right words, uh, more, uh, more culpable, more, uh, something uh, than a person who just wasn't there at the teaching. I, I, I didn't pay attention. So, but I had it, it was the teaching instruction was given to me. Did I, un, did I understand that correct or is it my, my head cool? Uh, yes, I think it is our problem is exactly that, is not paying attention or not giving its proper value or not being able to apply it because our priorities are at others than the application of the teachings. So those who were not that day in that classroom, they are less responsible than you 
who were there in the classroom that day and, and chose not to pay attention. Why did you not pay attention? You were there. Does it make you more responsible or less responsible to those who perhaps didn't even bother to show up and could? And why? All of that is taken into consideration. But what the message here from us today is that we are all being exposed one way or another. Because when Kardec says the spirits are everywhere and they teach everywhere. Now we may choose to pay attention or not. We may choose to ignore it. We may choose to try our best to apply. And the try our best to apply is what is expected from us. You may not even succeed, but we try our best. Then we go back to the talents of, or to the, to the parable of the talents, right? Those who receive two, do they receive five, they did something with it. And they were successful because they did something with it. But the one who chose to bear it is the one who was being expelled because he chose not to use what was given. I remember a lecture of uh, our old when we say, even if he had used those two, uh, the, that one talent and did things wrong, didn't work out, end up into more debit, would be, would be preferable to try, to try to good will naturally and, and get something right. And the, the, well, the importance of that parable is that there is no wrong in trying. There is no wrong in doing. There is wrong of being completely passive and inactive when you have tools at your hands to use. And when you do it, you get it right. Things come right. Because it says the one who got five multiplied, the one who got two multiplied. is to choose to be inactive, to choose to ignore, to choose to rebel against is, is what really gets us in trouble. You know, it leads me, you know, how there's, um, uh, there could be, even on a, um, an online uh, study group like this, there could be those that uh, just, leave it on so they can listen, but with very little attention. And then there's those who are attentive and learning something, you know, so it's varying degrees of, um, of uh, I don't know what it is, but it's very responsibility. And I think when um, the Pharisees ask, On, the, on item 11, let me read so it's better this way. But I have come to this world to exercise judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. But hearing these words, certain Pharisees who, who were with him said to him, then are we blind also? And, and Jesus answered, if you were blind, you would not have sinned. But, but now you say that you see. That's why the sea remains in you. Meaning that <clears throat> when you were blind, where you did not know anything, you could not commit a sin. But now because you see, that's what propels you to the, the sin to remains with you. Because you continue doing things in knowledge that you did in ignorance. Or more important, you continue not doing things that you should be doing with knowledge that now you're responsible because now you have that knowledge. Yeah. 
when we are savages, we are not responsible for applications of the divine laws because we are savages. We're no longer there. Now we're even in a state of civility that we are much more culpable. I was also not aligned to what right now and I was picking up things that plumfets that Brazilians are throwing on, on, on the ground because I was embarrassed. Don't they know that it's ridiculous to just receive a plant and just drop on the floor? Don't, they, don't we know better? And I mean, we all oh, well, don't we know better? The leader is not a nice thing to do. What does it mean to a bunch of Brazilian on a line and a bunch of garbage on the floor? What does it tell about us? How ignorant are we? Don't we know? Comments, questions? Yeah. I think we, you know, we, we have always to remember the law of progress uh, and the evolutionary path, right? Um, we evolve uh, through uh, making mistakes and learning from the mistakes and not repeating them again. Uh, whenever we make a mistake and we learn from it, uh, not knowing what we're doing, we're not creating a, a karma. Whenever we are uh, repeating the mistake is when we are creating the karma. So that's the, the knowledge and the responsibility of knowledge and the, the, the cause and consequence directly related to, to our knowledge of what we were doing, right? And in the end, uh, you know, we go back to say it's our own conscience and, uh, and our own conscience when we are um, more primitive has no notion of uh, responsibility for these acts that uh, are are as you, as I almost said up in, in the absolute they are wrong, but in the relative they are uh, our way of learning and to evolving and making mistakes and trying to learn from our mistakes. So it's always important to remember to go back to. The, the, the basics of our evolutionary path. Um, yeah, and now that you said that, it kind of hit me here that we put um, intention first, knowledge second. I think that makes sense, right? And if you have a true intention of going so much against the law, perhaps it, we don't know it. We may even pretend that we know it, but if someone really has the intention of cause something, let's say a severe harm to someone intentionally, I even start to doubt this person really know it. This person was dumping, littering the street. Do they really know how, how bad that is, how severe that is, ethically speaking? What does it mean? How how does how do we represent who we are and where we come from? Do you have an understanding of that? If I had left left those planets that I saw, I could pick it pick it up. Have not picked it up. Would would I be more responsible for those who throw them on the floor in the first place? If you're walking on the street and you see a banana peel on, on the pavement, you don't pick up. Are you more in blame, more blameful if somebody steps and breaks their neck because of it? Because you know better. Perhaps the person who dropped that banana peel does not know it. And I'm not talking about the, the legal laws. I'm talking about the divine laws, the laws with our own conscience. Yeah. Am I perhaps more responsible for that broken neck when I passed by that banana peel? I did not pick it up when I could, or the one who threw it there out of complete ignorance? 
Yeah, you go back to the question in the Spirit's book, right? You are not only responsible for the, uh, the for the, the the bad that you didn't do, but for the good that you you didn't do also, right? For the that's right, you know. So, it, the, but again, a very good statement uh, because uh, it can make us much more aware of uh, what's around us and what we can do. You know, if we t take responsibility in, in not doing the good that we should do. Right. But again, people, very important here, do not let this be a downer we are just going to bring us up okay because we drop the ball all the time okay <laughs> is living and learning okay you can continue reading any more comments i have to make it stop here because now we're going to have a very specific to spiritist and uh, even to mediums over here. So we can go a little bit of all the specifics here. Okay. Mediums who receive good communications are even more blameworthy, assisting in evil. For often they write their own condemnation. And if they were not so blind by pride, they would realize that the spirits are addressing them personally. However, Instead of applying to themselves the lessons they write or those they see written, their sole thought is to apply them to others, thereby confirming these words of Jesus. You see a speck in your neighbor's eye, but you do not see the log in your own. Through these words, if you were blind, you would not have sinned. Jesus meant that blameworthiness is proportional to one's enlightenment. Thus, the Pharisees who had the intention of being and actually were the most enlightened individuals of their people were now reprehensible in God's eyes than the unlearned people. The same applies today. Therefore, much will be asked of spiritists because they have received much, but also to those who have taken advantage of the teachings, much will be given. The first thought of all sincere spiritists should be to find out if in the spirit's counsel, there is not something that might apply to themselves. Spiritism has multiplied the number of those who are called. Because of the faith provides, it will also multiply the number of those who are chosen. Thank you. So, we may have mediums or psychography or, psych or psychophony receiving messages, eloquent, beautiful messages, maybe very sim simply written, maybe more of a complex or more eloquent writing, but it's still equally good in moral content. Before it comes out to the general public, it passes through the medium. The medium is the first one who get it. So the medium perhaps have a degree more of responsibility in not acting on the, the message that they receive. And we had said here many times that case with uh, Devout Pereira Frank when he was feeling a little bit depressed, a little bit down, and complained to Joanna de Angelis that she write messages for everyone else, you know, for whom, for this, for that, for everyone else. He's, she's writing messages, but never wrote anything for him himself directly. And Joanna reminded him, Joanna de Angelis reminded him, pick up any books over there. And Pick up the book and start to, um, you are you, 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 you. Pick up another book. You this, you that, you this, you that. Pick up another book. 
you this, you that, you see. Oh, that messages are for you. And so it says you, it's for you. I'm writing for you. You pass to everyone else, you publish because you want to. I'm giving the message to you. In an exercise of humbleness, it's important that uh, it must stand if you need to understand that, that <clears throat> the leadership could be very well a mission to enlighten the whole world. And it is. But it's first and foremost to enlighten the one who is acting as the intermediary. That if we can transform it into a mission, very often it's um, a deal that is paid in the spiritual realm. I'll give you a break here. You you serve as a medium because you need you need all those messages. We're gonna we're gonna give you so many good instructions and use them, and you'll be good, right? Or could even be uh, on a trial. Mira, she could be a trial. We're going to give you this tool. Let's see how you're going to use it. But remember, the tool is for you to use. And for you to use, use for yourself first. Then you pass it along. When a medium comes with the idea that, oh, what is you that message for X? I received that my method that applies for Y to Z. At the middle, there we is missing the target. There is wasting opportunity. Just about, and I'll, I'll be great enough to say that all the messages and should never say, oh, what I'm doing, you know. That comes from the Eliza uh, spirits as a universal. Uh, nature that is good for everyone. But it's up to everyone to recognize his or her needs, his or her limitations that in those messages. When the message come on about talking about impatience, you are there to think, oh, you should really listen to that matter. That guy is so impatient. He loses his school so easily. But a humble person, you say, how am I doing with my exercise of patience? How am I doing with controlling my myself and not explode and not being nasty to anyone? How am I being able to be indulgent with the difficulties of others? The mirror has to have that humility that the message is first for the one receiving. And then the one who receives, they choose to spread it to everyone else. Because again, it has universal moral value and it's good for everyone. If one may be able to read and sincerely say, I don't need this, I'm done with this lesson already. It's possible, it's possible. But um, I find it hard to believe, but it's possible. Is absolutely possible that a medium may receive a message that it's not really for them. It's for others because they are above, they have passed that grade already. But, you know, living this world, being exposed to this doctrine, being to receive, being able to receive those messages, the likelihood is that message is first for the one receiving it, and then exercising the mission of passing along. Because again, we are average and something is good for me, likely is good for others. And if that lesson is one that I need, likely others around me equally needs it. The medium has to have that understand in the exercise of mediumship with Jesus as the doctrine suggests. So the idea of you no. Know, you see a speck in your neighbor's eyes, but you, you, don't, you don't see the log in your eyes. A very dangerous thing. 
it is the one that is receiving match and the match will be asked. <clears throat> um, and again, we spiritists, we had the third organization, you know, for more direct. Everyone has, because the spirits are everywhere. So, but we have a very concrete and we, we choose to study it. We choose to get to understand it in, in greater depth. So the responsibility to internalize, to pass it from the intellect to the sentiments, it's, it's greater with us. Internalize intellectually, transform it to sentiments, and then exteriorize in action, in charity, benevolence, indulgence, forgiveness. Now, the good thing here is that there is the, the benevolence, the loving of those who write those things to us, and it says, the spirit is, has multiplied the number of those who are called. Not everybody's been called. Because of the faith, because of the faith provide, provides, it will also multiply the number of those who are chosen. I think this is a, it's a very hopeful. It is a very consoling statement. That the likelihood of being chosen is greater of not being chosen because we embrace this doctrine. Yes, we've been exposed to a lot. We had received a lot. And again, at the beginning, I said that we have a tendency to be kind of hard on ourselves in average. The same way that we have a tendency to see the ugly in others, we have a tendency to see the ugly in ourselves more than the good in ourselves. But I think most of us will persist, will try as hard as we did, even with all the faults that each one can point out. We are in that path that leads to be the chosen ones, more likely to be chosen than not to be chosen. Even with all the knowledge that you had received, not being able to apply a good deal of it. All right, comments? No, the other thing I can do one more. Okay. To him who already has, more will be given. 13. His disciples approached him and asked, Why do you speak to them in parables? He responded, Because to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to him who already has, more will be given and he will have in abundance. But regarding him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. That is why I speak to them in parables. For seeing, they see nothing. And hearing, they neither hear nor understand. And the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled in them when he said, you will hear with your ears, but will not understand. You will see with your eyes, but will not perceive anything. Matthew. Place close attention regarding what you hear, for the same measure will be used on you that you have used to, the me to measure others, and you will be given even more. For to him who has already has, more will be given, and regarding him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. It will be given to him who already has, and it will be taken away from him who does not have. Meditate on these great teachings, which have so often seemed paradoxical, to you. Those who have received are those who understand the meaning of the divine word. They have received solely because they have tried to become worthy, and the Lord in his merciful love encourages efforts that lead to goodness. These firm and persevering efforts attract the Lord's blessings. They are a magnet that attracts progressive advancement 
and the abundant blessings that render you strong enough to climb the holy mountain where at the summit is repose after labor. From him who has nothing or who has little, it shall be taken away. This should be understood as a figurative opposite. God does not take away from his creatures the good he has consented to give them. O oh, blind and deaf humanity, open your mind and your heart, see with your spirit, understand with your soul and do not interpret in such a coarsely unjust manner the words of, of him who has made God's justice shine resplendently in your sight. It is not God who takes from those who have received little, it is their own spirit, which wasteful and careless does not know how to preserve what it has and by nurturing it, increase the might dropped in their heart. Those who do not cultivate the field which their father's efforts earned for them and which they have inherited, see that field become covered with weeds. Is it their, fa is it their father who takes away the harvest that they did not want to prepare? if they allow the seeds meant to grow in that field to wither from lack of care, should they accuse their, their father of their, they produce nothing? No, of course not. Instead of accusing the one who had prepared everything for them of taking away his endowment, let them accuse the true author of their miseries and let them then repent and industrious, courageously get to work. Let them break the thankless soil with the effort of their will let them plow deeply with the help of, re or re of repentance and hope. Let them confidently sow the seed that they have chosen as good from among the bad and let them water it with their love and charity. Then God, the God of love and charity will give to them who have already received and then they will see their efforts crowned with success. And one grain will produce a hundred and another a thousand. Courage, O oh workers, take your hoes and your plows, tilt your hearts, pull up the weeds from it, so that so that there the good seed that the Lord has entrusted to you, and the dew of love will enable it to produce the fruits of charity. Thank you. The first thing to try to, to not to be so literal is the word giving, right? God gave us opportunities. God gave us a set of perfect laws that is meant for, for take, take us from simplicity and ignorance to complexity and spiritual perfection, spiritual purity, so to say. God gave us the seeds of the intelligence for us to grow it. God give us the seeds of free will for us to grow it in his infinite love. He's not going to give too much freedom for someone who doesn't know how to use freedom. So there's the seeds of intelligence for us to develop. And as we develop that intelligence, we increment the, our free will to go be relative to it. Because again, knowledge is important. You're not gonna give too much free will, too much freedom for someone who is ignorant. You're not gonna put a difficult machinery at the hand of someone who's not capable, not does not know how to use it. You have to educate that person first on how to use that tool, that machine. So God or this perfect system of laws provides opportunities. That's the giving there, right? And those opportunities are in association with the amount of intellectual and moral achievement have conquered, that we have conquered and not given to us. And the more we conquer, the more you, you'll be given to, to us. The more we have gained in terms of intellectual moral, 
conquest, the more opportunities to get more and more and more and more will be given to us. And for those <clears throat> who waste opportunities, the spiritual living is nothing. God or the system will take it away from you, the little have gained. Is that because if you allow it to remain unproductive, it becomes just a weight, that weight in your hand that becomes harder for you to act and do more things. I think the example of the, of the farmer is, very, is a very good one. If my father gave me a good piece of land and say that land is good, let's say for coffee. You no, know, it's proper for coffee. If you find this guidance that the way I used to use and I was successful and you do this and this and that time you do this and that time of day you do that, you should get good coffee. And I neglect instruction and just let the weed grow. Who is responsible? Is my father responsible for what I have not done? And if later I want to say, oh, now I want to get... Um, two, three years ahead. Now I want to get coffee out of that land. What am I gonna have to do now? I'm gonna have to go and go back, clean up that area. They'll do all the work that was already done that my father had done for me and say, just start planting now. Now I'm gonna have to start. Even from before, to the point that it was given to me. It was given to me, the land is ready, go plant coffee now. I neglect for three, four years. Now it's in, in a much worse shape than when it was given to me. Can I get to that point? Yes, and I will, if you put my effort. But now I have a lot more work ahead of me before I get to that point. And if I want to get coffee, I'm gonna have to go all the way back to, to when it was given to me, not the preparation that land, and wait to the time that it will be productive. I just waste a tremendous amount of time. Our progress is like that also. Opportunities are given to us. Use it, move along at the proper pace, and you'll be fine. Choose to neglect, choose to be lazy. Eventually going to wake up and say, Oosh, I have a lot to take, catch up. We can't catch up. But you are going to have to go back there and clean up all that soil and do all that, all that hard, hardship in order to, to get what should be getting a long time already. When Emmanuel then Publilensus met, Publilentus met Jesus and Jesus told him, you can follow me now or you can follow me in a thousand years, but you follow me. And that's you know, he, he had the humility to give us his books, his own life to let us know that indeed Jesus was right. How much hardship could he have avoided? How much hardship can we avoid? All right, comments, questions? We have five minutes left, not gonna go continue anymore. So um, we have the next, this coming Saturday, we have the, 50, uh, the, 50, the 50, 16th Spiritist Symposium. Uh, it will be broadcast live starting 11 a.m. Eastern time until 7 p.m. Uh, through the, the spiritissymposium.org uh, website. Uh, if you watch any Saturday lecture by the United States Spiritist Federation, it's the same link. You just go there and uh, watch at the, at the same link, okay? You'll be uh, some lectures, some round tables uh, in Spiritism, all in English. Um, it's also the 25th anniversary of the United States Spiritist Federation. Okay, so you're all invited this Saturday to 
to join us in the symposium. Um, next Sunday, first Sunday of the month, we'll, we'll be studying the book Liberation again, okay? All right, thanks everyone. Um, Carol, could you make your final prayer? Sure, thank you very much. Thank you, Elmo, John, and everybody today for being together and participating. Infinite creator and supreme intelligence, all goodness, all grace, we are grateful to be together again for the studies of the gospel according to spiritism. Each person has an opportunity to evolve and to advance in their spiritual life. Not everyone is ready, nor chooses to, de to develop their spirit. However, there is an open invitation. It is always there and available to us. Through our effort and studies, we will evolve and more opportunities will be available and advancement will prevail. Open your mind and heart and spirit to the goodness that is at hand. Cultivate the blessings through the efforts, through charity and love. We give thanks to our spiritual benefactors, the mentors, our teachers, for their inspiration, guidance, and for these wisdom teachings. May we receive the love, light, and peace of Christ within us to be within our hearts, within our minds, and with our actions. We pray for all suffering spirits in the spiritual world as well as the physical world. We know that the challenges may be very great at this time, for it is a paradigm shift. May the spiritist centers throughout the world be blessed and guided. May, may they always be protected in each and every endeavor that they, that they do. We give thanks now and ask for safety and protection as we go forth to family, friends, loved ones, and coworkers. We know that we will be guided as we ask, as we seek, and as we receive these blessings. We close now and remind ourselves to be beacons of light. Go forth now in peace, go forth now in love, in charity, and harmony. So be it.